Okay, good morning. Welcome to today's webinar, Essential Contracts in a Real Estate Transaction with Fred Fister. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Old Republic Home Protection, and allow them a few minutes to explain their services. Um, George and Gary, take it away. All right. Thanks. Good, thank you, Shirley. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is Gary Smith, and we have also George Underrisen here with Old Republic Home Protection. George, you want to start out and just uh, say a little bit? Well, yeah, you know, the um, we're talking about contracts today, the essential contracts, and, you know, our humble part of this is the home warranty, uh, which is a part of the transaction. When, when you're filled, what we recommend you do uh, since we have different levels of service, different levels of coverage, be real specific about how you fill out your purchase agreement. Uh, there are some lines in there that say upgrade, pool. Uh, is, uh, be as specific as you possibly can in case uh, you, know, you want to make sure that, that you get the warranty that's appropriate for the property. And uh, yeah. you can always add coverage after the close of escrow, but write that in. In case something happens, I can, we can always go back and uh, make it retroactive based on the purchase agreement. Yeah, and I, like what George was saying, because the, my whole concept here is, is just to order correctly. Um, there's so many times, it's like when you have car insurance, you know, they, they want to understand the type of car, all this, where it's housed, if it's garage, the same with the home. You guys got to take the time to understand, digest it. Hey, does it have AC? Does it are the washer and dryer staying with the unit? Do you want the coverage? Does it have pool and spa? So be very specific. And like George mentions, write it in the RPA. And if it's written in the RPA and for whatever ordered properly through the transaction coordinator or it gets whatever the case may be, uh, we will honor that coverage if it's written in the RPA. Um, but the homeowner does have up to 60 days after the close of escrow to add any or modify the coverage um, but the other, other thing I want to touch base on is just um, to initiate the order, you know, take control of the ordering process for the home warranty. It's super important that your name is on that because the more, the more orders we see coming from you, from your company, anytime there's a situation where we need to take a second look, we need some leverage. We need to know, hey, you're a dedicated customer. We'll go, we'll, go, we'll go to bat. I've been at this for 33 years. I've been at it with Old Republic for about four. So it's like, you know what? Give us that opportunity to, to, to you know, come to the table, but um, be as specific as you can and get involved in the early stages of either initiating the order or at least making sure your name is on that order confirmation um, as the co-op agent. So we know you're involved there. Um, yeah, we're here to help you. So especially on those larger homes, uh, you might have to get a, a quote or you might have questions about you know, the different things that we offer. And that's really critical before the close. Uh, and then of course we're mm -hmm. available after the close of escrow when problems happen. It's, it's a problem solving business that we're in. So keep us in mind yeah. in terms of being a resource for that, that reason. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, uh it's over the table, get it, get it in the system. And uh, you can always, if you're representing the seller, you have the ability to add seller's coverage uh, sort of listing coverage, as we call it, you know, so it's a home warranty during the listing period. And, um, you know, so lots of good benefits. So that's pretty much all I have. Uh, George, I don't know if you have anything more. No, no, thanks for having us. Like I said, we're here yeah. just as a resource uh, because it's, there's all, you know, the, your customers are your referral base of business. And it's a stewardship yeah. we take very seriously because it's our referral base you know, of business too. You know, we, we want to take care of your clients, especially if you're representing the buyer. So do keep us in mind as a resource and thanks so much for having us today. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you all for being here and thank you to George and Gary and Old Republic um, for sponsoring this event. It's, 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 incredibly, it's incredibly important to, to have sponsors and certainly to have a home warranty. Um, as an attorney, uh, one of the things that I see is if more people got the home warranty, we'd have less claims. So maybe I'm, uh, I, I maybe don't get the home warranty, right guys? <laughs> but uh, uh, just kidding. No, it would, it would really, it would really help um, if you advise your clients there. Some, some clients aren't, aren't doing it and they really should and, and Old Republic is good as it gets. So thank you for sponsoring this event. Um, today, as you can see, hopefully everyone can see my screen share here. Uh, we're gonna talk about essential contracts in a real estate transaction. Um, 
I'm going to tell you that it, it, it's almost impossible to do a, uh, a Zoom meeting in any length of time and talk about all the contracts that CAR puts out there and says are essential or says are important to a transaction. The book just gets bigger and bigger every year. And there's, there's uh, the amount of changes that come through every year makes it incredibly difficult to keep track of them all. But what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to try to go through the uh, purchase agreement because that is such a critical document in uh, every transaction. It's the, it's the foundation, if you will, of, of every deal that you ever do. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some, you know, where other uh, documents come into play, but I'm going to talk about it from a perspective of an attorney. Um, and, and that may be a little a little bit unique from what you're you're used to when when you're you know in your risk management meetings or in your in your uh, inner office meetings because I'm going to talk about you know where I see liability claims where I see problems where I see the disputes because I get all the bad transactions right all the transactions that aren't that aren't going well or there's a problem or there's a claim or there's a lot there's a lawsuit those are the things I see and so. I look at this and I, and I want to discuss it from the perspective of someone who litigates these, these matters. Um, so without the further ado, I'll, I'll jump in because I know we have limited time today. Here's my bio. Um, as you can see, the, uh, I'm general counsel for, for North Sandio County um, and I have been for, for several years. Uh, this is what I do. I represent real estate agents and brokers and your clients in, in these type of claims, either you know, before the close of escrow, after the close of escrow, before the lawsuit, after the lawsuit, uh, you name it, uh, we're, we're defending. Um, you may have heard of my firm, White and Bright. We've been around 40 years and, uh, and we've been doing this, this work since the inception and, and have been representing North County, actually as general counsel since the inception of North County, uh, the association. So here's what we're gonna, we're, we're gonna cover today. Um, like I said, I, we, we may not have enough time to get through every single detail, um, but we're gonna do the best we, we possibly can in the time that we have. And um, I wanna save questions for the end. I, I know that we uh, that there's a chat, but it's, it's quite difficult to monitor that and talk, but I will do my best and, and hopefully we, can, we have time at the end. Or if, if, uh, if we don't have time at the end, feel free to call me. I have my, I'll have my, my phone number uh, and my email address and, and I, strongly encourage follow-up questions. Um, I, I make myself available for this industry um, in order to, to uh, uh, make sure that you have the information, your clients have the information that they need. So let's just jump right into it. Contracts 101. I, I'm not going to do a, a full, uh, you know, what's a contract, but it, it, it's important that you, that you understand this because there, there are, and, and, I, and I apologize if, if this seems very uh, elementary, but it, it takes it. I, I see this. I see this often, where people f actually think they're in contract, or or one side doesn't think they're in contract. Oh, we, we signed the counter offer, and the other side countersigned it. You know, are we are we actually in escrow? And yeah, yes, you are. You're in contract. So at its fundo, at, at the basic elements of a contract is you need you need an offer, you need acceptance of that offer, and you need an intent to create a contract and consideration. So what consideration in here is is typically money, but it is but it is essentially you're you're giving something for something. There's there you're some consideration on your side for something on their side, and then of course there is the le you know, is it a legal contract? You can't make an illegal contract, uh, but we're not doing that here. Uh, and then there's always the capacity issue, and I, and this is my shameless plug that I do a, um, I, I do a. Uh, another seminar on, on with which deals with capacity issues, uh, specifically in the context of, of elder transactions. That's becoming a bigger and bigger part of the practice that um, uh, that people really need to, uh, especially if you're doing if you're selling any real estate in San Diego County, um, do you need to be attuned to that? Especially as the population grows older and the concentration of of wealth and, and real estate is with an older generation. So capacity issues are a are, are whole t topic in itself. But, let's, but what we're gonna do today, at least initially here, is we're gonna talk about the RPA. And I'm gonna go into a detail that you probably uh, haven't seen in a while. Um, but it, I think it's important to walk through the RPA because it's, it's so fundamental 
to everything you do. And, 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 I, and I, and I, you know, I, I see this often that people breeze through it and they try to do it quickly. Cause so, you know, a client comes to you and says, I want to do make an offer on this place. And they're not really thinking through all the bells and whistles and they're doing that later and it ends up hurting them. So understanding the RPA uh, as on a fundamental level, I think is critical. And again, some of you, this will be very basic. Some of, some of you, you know, this, this will be, uh, there might, there'll be things in here that you didn't think of or that uh, are enlightening. So uh, let's just go into the uh, a clause by clause of the RPA. On its fundamental, um, as we talked about, and in, in, uh, I just talked about the contracts 101, obviously to get into contract, we need a buyer signature or seller signature. We need delivery and receipt by the buyer or the agent within the time frame. And we need acceptance within that, within that time frame. So make sure you have all those elements. You know, if, if you're accepting outside the time frame of the offer, that's, uh, you know, you need some type of an amendment, uh, for instance. So um, I, I want to make that clear. But let's, let's go directly into the contract. And, and again, this is going to be, uh, we're going to go somewhat line by line. And I hope you can see my cursor because I'll try to highlight items that, that, that come up in, in our important here. Um, and, and again, I, if, if I'm breezing through something, it doesn't necessarily mean I don't think it's important. It's just that most, I, I don't see a lot of issues with it. Um, again, this is from a, a perspective of an attorney who, who sees problems. One of the things I, I don't see a lot of people understanding is the date prepared. Um, they don't, they, they somehow use that as a, uh, a you know, they, even if the date prepared is, is somewhat in the past, they, 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 uh, they, there's a lot of confusion over the date prepared. That, that is really just a reference date. So I want people to understand that. The, the date that I think is, is the most critical and what we see a, a lot of issues on is the close of escrow date. Um, this, it's 1D. And I, I, I think it, it's important in this coronavirus time to, to consider th that close of escrow date and consider it not necessarily being a hard date but being a, a date that can move and, and preparing for that. I, I think a lot, of, a, a lot of people, since they're, um, how do I put this? They're, there's a lot of competition for properties, especially right now. And so they think they need the, the, the quickest close. You know, we need to close in, in 20 days and 10 days. And they're setting unrealistic expectations for themselves, which they're unable to meet. And I've had a number of claims in just the last couple of weeks where lenders haven't been able to close in the time frame, they haven't been able to get into the property, um, they haven't been able to get inspections, they've had, and, and people are missing their escrow dates. And of course, what, what do sellers in situations like that do in a rising market? They try to shake people out of deals, unfortunately. And so I think it's really important to look at that close of escrow um, and, and, because that's the date you're going to be targeting here as your close of escrow date in this in this transaction. Um, the the next item here that I want to highlight is form AD. This is this is like automatically checked and it's the disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships. So you see that form. That's really the foundational form of your disclosure duties. A lot of people don't, you know, they just see it checked. It's a form that's attached to the to the uh, the agreement. And they really don't go over it. And I, I encourage you to, to, re, to read that form in detail and really understand it. And I'll talk about that form uh, if we have some time here as we go into uh, to, uh, the additional forms. But that's, that's the foundation of your relationship. Of course, you all know, uh, everyone knows and loves this 2B where you put in your brokerages and you and uh, to make sure you can get that commission and you and you put in your information there. I don't see a lot of, of issues with that. Um, I do see issues here. So this is this is the bottom half of page one, this uh, of the RPA. And there's this section here which I, I encourage you never to never to use, which is the the buyer to uh, it's it's actually three A two where the buyer deposits with agent the a personal check. I, I, I strongly encourage you don't handle funds for clients. It's, it's, uh, it, it's really unnecessary in today's day and age. And unless there's a really, really good reason 
it's it's so much easier not to have that to have that duty and not to have that that potential problem. Um, so I, I don't see that being checked very often anymore, but it, it is out there. Um, the something that that is is important is this increased deposit issue. We're seeing we're still seeing a lot of deposit disputes, and um, especially now with with short escrows and with the and with the delays, I, I encourage people to consider the increase in deposit. There's actually a form for this. It's the RID form, um, but it, it's it's an important thing that a lot of people aren't looking at, but I think they should. In it is the consideration to their seller that if this person can't you know, it can't perform, you know, are they gonna have increased costs? Should there be an increase in the deposit? Should, there, should some of the money go hard, if you will, meaning non-refundable? That's a, that's a conversation I think that every seller's agent should have with their client. And if you see it in there and you're a buyer's agent, um, you know, if, if, that's, if that's coming into to something like this, then that there's a strong, you know, there's a conversation about that too, that could really increase your offer uh, or make it look stronger, even if you have a longer escrow. Uh, that's that's a way to you know to make a stronger offer. Of course, then there's the all cash offer, uh, which is which is the three uh, C. Uh, I, I still see a lot of people checking that, even if they're not all cash. It, it seems to be something that uh, is it, it's almost like their waiver of their of their loan contingency, and so they do that um, as a way to to try to um, pump up their offer. Um, but my suggestion is don't use it unless you really all, you really, you really do have cash. And, and really the, I think the point for, for, for agents is if someone is, is, is saying that, uh, that they have all cash and they really don't protect yourself, um, protect yourself by, by saying, you know, you, you wanted to make an all cash offer. You wanted to waive a loan contingency. I understand that you actually are shopping for a loan. Um, you know, it's against, it's against my advice to do something like that, but you know, that you, we can do it. You know, that type of protection for you, I think is, is, is very important in these situations that if they're going to go against your advice or they're going to do something that isn't uh, orthodox in a transaction like this, that you do a confirming email. Uh, and I'll talk about that in detail today. The confirming email is, is what I love to see. Because I'll tell you, the, the cases with the confirming email are the cases that don't that don't become cases, right? They don't get those people generally don't get sued. It they the the claim gets cut off because the client the client or the unhappy client or the unhappy bu uh, buyer realizes that oh I was informed of that. Um, they told me that they weren't going to do that for me, and look, they you know uh, I took the risk. So the confirming email is important on something like that. Um, additional here that the loans, I don't see a lot of, of issues that come across with these type, with these loans. Uh, what I see is I see people not necessarily being able to get loans. Um, if your clients do have, have constraints on their loans, I, I do, I, I do like to see that in here, um, in, in the first and second loan. Um, and, you know, hopefully they don't have that, but if they do, that's, that's really where, where it should go. Um, but again, I don't see a lot of a lot of claims there. It's more of a the lender can't perform, and then they and then there's a breach. Uh, that's that's typically what what ends up happening. Um, there's also the possibility of seller financing. I, you know, I, I don't see that very often in residential transactions. I see it occasionally in in land or in very specific properties that where where that comes into play. But I know that most of you aren't doing that. Most of you aren't selling. You know, a home in Carlsbad with seller financing, it just doesn't happen very often. We try to steer clients away from it, if at all possible, because generally when someone wants to sell a home, they want to get out of the home. Um, they don't want to become a lender. Um, but occasionally you'll have to, you'll have to visit that. Let's, let's move on to page two here. This is the, what I would, I would see the, the verification, um, this verification section of the down payment again don't see a lot of a lot of issues there um, and i don't see a lot of of issues on the uh, on the appraisal issue on the appraisal i see sometimes the the appraisal being not coming in where, where they want it to come in 
but I don't see it being a, 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 a lot of claims regarding the, the contingency for it. But just know that this is the section here where you should verify. I, I think if you're going to verify, you should always have the verification attached. Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to have any. Uh, uh, it, there, there seems to be no advantage to providing it a couple of days later. The in addition, the same thing is is the is the pre qualification letter. Again, no advantage really to providing it later. That's that that should be something that you have a discussion with your buyer prior to making any offer. But just know that you you can you can uh, get additional time you know, within three days or, or however many you put in there. The, the loan contingency, I do, again, I, I do see issues with the loan contingency right now. And I have for years seen the, the loan contingency issue where they think that the lender is performing and lo and behold, the lender says they're performing and all of a sudden, you know, some underwriter gets involved and says, I want, you know, the last three years of tax returns and, and I want this, I want that. And all of a sudden, you're, you're missing your, your escrow deadline. So I think it's really important to have that, that conversation with your client on, you know, can we really realistically do a loan contingency removal in 21 days or however many days we need? Um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a discussion I'd wanna have right from the beginning. And a lot of people I don't think are having that, that, that discussion. I'm going to move to the um, to the next section here, um, and this and this is actually a section that uh, is that we do have a lot of, a lot of issues on, and and this is where I think you you really make your um, you you add a lot of value to a transaction. One of them, of course, here is is the notorious uh, COP, the contingency of uh, the the contingency of property sale. This this comes up all the time. And it's, an, it's very important that you go over that form and you know that form in detail. When we're saying the essential forms in a transaction, that's a form that I would study and I would know if I was a new agent, if I was an existing agent uh, or, or an agent that's been around for a long time is, is we, we see more and more of, of this issue because it's, it's just so expensive to, to purchase a home in San Diego and so a lot of times people have to have a contingent sale, uh, a contingent sale property. Um, and, and we're seeing claims where it, it won't necessarily close or the seller it doesn't realize all the bells and whistles on the COP form that let the buyer get out of a, get out of a deal if that other escrow doesn't close or that other escrow has problems. And that's, that's really where I would, I would spend some time studying so that you're aware of that when it does come up. The other, the other issues here on, on this section are the addenda and the buyer seller advisories. As you can see, these just keep getting, we keep getting more and more of these. Um, you know, the septic well and property monument, you know, that's, is that only for rural property use? Yes, but it's also for other, it's other, for other properties. Um, there's, there's a number of, of documents that you can use as addendums here, things like the, uh, the, the court confirmation addendum for, for things like bankruptcy sales. We're probably going to see some of those in the next year or so. You're going to see a number of, of bankruptcy sales, or you're going to see the, the short sale addendum um, on, on transactions. So it's, it's really important that you are aware of these and you're, and you're looking at this ahead of time. A lot of people gloss over this and they're not really explaining these forms. They, they check the box, they, maybe they add them on, but they're not sitting down with their, with their buyers and explaining these forms. And we get these buyers who come in and say, uh, you know, that they, they had no idea that, that, you know, this transaction was subject to, uh, you know, approval by a bankruptcy court, for instance. Um, so so it's, I, I, would, I would encourage you to look at this addendum. And the same thing is with the buyer seller advisories. These are underutilized. Now it's um, the one that's checked here is essentially by the, the default of the buyer in, uh, inspection advisory. Uh, that's a document that is incredibly useful, useful in litigation. Every time we have a claim, we, we, we use that form and we, and we say, look, the buyer was you know, advised to do this. And, and every time the buyer says that was a uh, that was a form that was never that they never went over with me. 
And uh, I had no idea. It was in the stack of documents that they gave me. And I have no, I never saw it before. That's, that's what I hear over and over again. And so what, what I, what I, what I want to suggest here is that if you want to avoid claims is that if you're, a, if you're a buyer, uh, if you're a buyer's agent, you're, you're going over those, those type of documents with them. Uh, the same thing, the, like the LAD, uh, the local area disclosure, um, that's a document. Uh, I have a little picture here of it. Um, the, the one that, uh, uh, the local area disclosure has a lot of information on San Diego County specifically. That's something that 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 can be provided with these with these transactions as well. Uh, there's a lot of other documents here that that just aren't uh, checked, but can be the other. For instance, you know things I'm seeing uh, issues on is is the the buyer pre occupancy storage addendum. I mean that's you know people are are now you know moving. A, a pod to to houses uh, prior to prior to close and storing it there. There's an addendum for that. So I don't mean to to say that's a really important document, but but the point is is that there's a lot of documents. CAR puts anything you can kind of think of. CAR probably has a form for it. So something like bringing a you know a pod onto a property prior to the close of escrow, they have a form for that. And so. I encourage you to, to, to you know, go through those forms and, and familiarize yourself with them. There's another form that, that recently just came out here in uh, June, which I want you to be aware of. And I, I thought this was the appropriate place to talk about it, which is the uh, uh, square footage and lot size advisory. That form is the S, I have to look here on my notes, SFLS form. Um, that form, you know, I, I don't want to say it came directly out of the Hariki case. Those of you who are familiar with that case and the discrepancy in size of a property and square footage, but it, it appears to have come out of that. And it comes out of, uh, I believe there's a form in another part of California, I think it's San Francisco, where they, where they actually have been using a form like that for years. And, but know that it's now available in your, in your CAR forms that uh, when there's a discrep, this is really for when there's a discrepancy in square footage, and I see this a lot. Where, uh, and we see a lot of claims on it, where the the house says it's 1,200 square feet, or the uh, or I say the the records say it's 1,200 square feet, the MLS says it's 1,600 square feet, the buyer say, or the seller says it's you know it's 1,800 square feet, and it's 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 all coming from different information and, and add-ons, and so that form is is uh, it has the ability to to uh, to document where you know the the source of the information and I'll talk about that when we get a little bit later but it's 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 about attributing the source of the information and not taking it on as your liability what you don't want to do is you don't want to verify information as as if you checked it if you haven't and 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 that's really what I see is is a, one of the biggest problems or one of the the I shouldn't say one of the biggest problems one of the areas of liability is when agents take on, uh, they, they represent things that they, they don't know and they don't attribute it to where they actually got that information. And so it looks like they're making the disclosure that, oh, this is 1800 square feet. When they just got that information, they didn't measure it, they got that information from somewhere else that, uh, and, and that person may be wrong. So this is so this area here is is certainly where you would you would add additional forms if you need them, um, and uh, and and also where you would put in some special terms. We're seeing people get creative with special terms with other terms, I should say. Um, there, CAR puts out an advisory that don't alter this contract without without the advice of an attorney. I I, I don't I, I don't want to suggest that you 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 can't add other terms there. But if you're creating new legal clauses or or uh, or changing how how parts of this contract work, I, I do agree with their their position that you shouldn't be doing that without at least consulting with your broker and maybe consulting with the broker with the broker's counsel um, because the effect of that may you may have unintended consequences. But but again, that's where you can put the other terms. Allocation of costs. This is something that. Section seven, this is something you're all familiar with. Um, I won't go over that in detail, but, but remember this is all negotiable. I know there is a, sta you know, a standard in San Diego or a standard in Southern California of, of who pays what, but I see that somewhat changing. Um, and, and to the extent that I see that being a little 
it, it, it all depends on who has the leverage in, in a lot of these transactions. But I, I do see people shifting that around depending on, on their, the amount of leverage that they have. Um, so just know that this is all negotiable. There isn't some standard that everyone needs to, to adhere to. Um, but of course, there is the, the pra you know, your practice and procedure. Uh, make sure this is all filled out though. I, I do see uh, situations where people seem to forget to do some of these things and then they, they get into escrow and they're like, okay, who pays for this? And you know, if you haven't negotiated up front, it's the type of thing where uh, your, your buyer may be in for a surprise or your seller may be in for a surprise. Um, you know, I, I always say the buyer, the seller has the leverage before the contract is entered into. Once the contract is entered into, the buyer has the leverage. And, you know, and, and depending on who you represent in these transactions, you know, you, you want to make sure that this is, this is, this is um, uh, tight, you know, that, you're, that, you, that you thought of these, these things ahead of time. And especially, you know, you have these additional sections, buyer shall pay for this, buyer shall pay for that. If you have these you know, additional inspections and you're thinking ahead, you know, we're going to, you know, this is on a, this is on a slope. I, my, my buyer really is, it's, you know, they, they might really want a engineering report or they want some environmental report or they want something that, uh, you know, ahead of time, I mean, included in here, don't, don't wait. Um, if, especially if you want the seller to pay for it, um, and seller, you know, seller's agents, you might want to push back on some of these things. Um, so, uh, obviously you can fill that section out, but, but again, overlooked, a lot of people aren't looking at this ahead of time and I encourage you to do so. Um, I'll, I'll keep moving here because I know we have a lot of information today. Um, this section here, items included in sale. Uh, this is, this, this sounds like the, like the small things, but again, I, I see, I see issues here. Um, and one of the issues that, that seems to come up is the, uh, the uh, the fact that people don't people think that they're going to keep certain things when they're really not, and if you don't specify uh, that you're going to you know you're going to exclude items and in, in, in C, you're not going to get them back. So make sure that when you when you're representing that seller that you're really going through this with them and saying, hey, they're going to want this, they're going to want that, they're going to want all these things, and don't think you're going to take the washer and dryer if you're not. And, and have that conversation uh, because you really must specify that. I also wanna highlight 8B5, which is the least or leaned items and systems. This really is solar panels, right? There could be other things, but I, I consider this the solar panel section. I used to do a, a, an entire program on solar panels a couple of years ago because uh, people were putting these solar panels on their property and then they weren't, they, they, they didn't know if they were leased, they didn't know if they were owned, and people would get into these transactions and they'd be 15 days into it. And then, and then they find out, oh, those are leased. Oh, I need to get the approval of the, of the lender to, do the, to transfer these. And it was, it was killing deals. It was holding up deals. It was causing all sorts of disputes. It's a little bit better now. I think there's uh, a lot of agents are, are attuned to it, but it's, it's, still, it's still something that if I'm meet, if I if if I'm an agent and I'm meeting with someone who wants to sell the property and I see solar panels on the roof, I want the documentation. I don't want their word that they own those or that they they might have, you know they they oh the lease is easy don't worry I got that somewhere. I want to see the actual documentation, and I and I'd suggest you know the, in in this you have the this time frame you know you have the same time frame in paragraph 14a which is typically seven days or or less maybe more but normally seven days to provide. It as one of your disclosures, I'd want that. I'd want that day one. I mean, don't wait on on solar panel uh, leaned or leased items. That's something that should be and can be disclosed very early in the transaction. So that's what I consider that section to be. And again, getting less and less uh, issues on that. So maybe everyone's taking has been taking care of that uh, a lot better. Um, again, ex items excluded from sale. That's that's the section here. Um, the, the next section, again, a heavily disputed section and something that, um, it can really concerns me in the coronavirus era. And this is the, the seller occupying the property 
sorry, it kind of spans two slides here, but but it's it's nine uh, A through through C really, and this is that that famous SIP form, um, and, and I'd say it's one of the most disputed parts of the contract because people want to stay in possession. Um, are you creating a rental contract with them? You know, they've they've uh, uh, CAR has tried to make it into a license to try to make it a uh, a very short term period, but you know, I, I see people where they want to stay for, you know, I want to stay for 60 days and now have you, you know, now you're using the, um, you know, now you're using the RLAS form and, and are you creating a rental contract? Yes. And guess what? You can't evict people, right? We're in the coronavirus era. I mean, I did a, I did a presentation and and I think it was March or April and, you know, we were, I, I was ballparking people on with the, uh, with the uh, the courts being shut down and the uh, and the rent uh, you know the rent deferments and the and the fact that you couldn't evict I was ballparking people on if you have a rent dispute you were looking at November back then to to actually get someone out and so you can imagine what that would you know and things haven't changed all that much I'll tell you that um, this presentation isn't about that but. What, what I'd suggest is that if you're, if you're doing a long-term rental on this, you know, and they don't want to get out and they say they got, they have coronavirus or they have, you know, they have some, they're, they're concerned, they don't have anywhere to go. I mean, you, you might, you know, you, you might have just gotten your client into a long-term rental situation where they can't get this person out um, for, for months and months and they may not be prepared for that. So I would have a really hard conversation with any client who is considering uh, a seller continuing to occupy the property uh, after the close of escrow, even if it's even if you're using the SIP, but especially if you're looking at 30 days or more. I mean, there's ways to to get around it, but it's and there's you know, and, and sometimes these things work, but I'm I'm seeing claims on this and and real problems. So uh, that's that's a really hard conversation, and it's one of those things that you may want to discuss. You know, you may. Uh, recommend that they discuss with their counsel or that they, that they get an attorney on something like that so that they know what their risks are. These are buying a million dollar house, right? And they, and they may not be able to move in for six months. That's, that's material to me, right? If, I, if I'm moving my family. Um, and so it's, it's something that, you, you know, don't take that liability on yourself is my point. It's, it's something that if, if they have a real question on what are my risks of doing something like this, that's, that's when I refer to counsel. That's when I, ref, you know, I, I make that recommendation and say, you know, I'm not an expert on evictions, or, you know, I'm being the agent here, I'm saying I'm not an expert on evictions. I'm not an expert on what my legal rights are here or what the coronavirus emergency orders coming down from, from uh, the, the state are. But hey, I, I know an attorney who you can discuss this with, or you can discuss it with your own attorney. And, you know, and, and you should do that. Or I, I strongly recommend that. That's, that's a perfect way of, I hate to say deflecting the issue, but of protecting yourself is, is what I would characterize. Protecting yourself for that, that inevitable issue that'll come up once they buy the house and, and this, guess what, the seller doesn't wanna move. Um, you know, so, so that is, that's a issue I really wanna highlight there. Same thing with tenant occupied property. I didn't go into that, but, the, but it, it actually might be even worse with a tenant occupied property. Um, and, and so I, I'm seeing clients who have tenant occupied property you know, it's it's almost like the like a cash for keys. They're, they're almost giving bonuses to tenants if the tenant needs to be out. They're almost giving bonuses to the tenant so that they deliver possession because they know that, or at least they're they're getting they're they're learning this that if the tenant doesn't want to move, even if they've agreed to, you have to start the eviction process. And and how many months is that going to be? Um, you know, it's it's in this coronavirus era, it's going to be even longer than you could possibly anticipate. Um, and so, yeah, consider that, you know, have that, that's another type of conversation to have with your client that if you have a tenant property that you need the, you need them out, uh, consider that, consider that, uh, as a possibility that a, a cash bonus, it sounds silly. You're thinking, why would I ever give a tenant a cash bonus? But it's better than a, you know, a, uh, a breach of contract claim and a, and a claim against you that you breached your fiduciary duty and didn't advise them of that. So, um, I, again, that's. That's a critically important section here. It's only become more important in the last uh, five months. The section 10 here, this is your statutory disclosures. This is the things that, that must be disclosed. Um, 
and you know where your where your TDS comes from, your SBQ, your natural hazard disclosure. Um, this is this is wh where it, where it starts. I don't think I've ever heard of a a, cl a client, meaning a buyer or seller, who's actually read this section. Um, they they tend to they just gloss right over this. There isn't a signatory area, and they they just move on. However, this is where it really comes into play that that you must conduct your inspection and you must disclose what you know. Now, I, I often, we often hear that where people think, well, I didn't see it. So I, you know, it, it, that, that's one part of your disclosure obligation. Your other disclosure obligation is if you know something that's material or affects the, it affects the value or desirability of the property, you have to disclose it. And, and this, these are the forms where that comes into play. And again, I'm gonna go into those forms in, in a little bit here. But that's but that's where they they, uh, they enter this contract and are incorporated into this contract. Um, the this is an issue I want to highlight down here. This um, the and because they it's it's highlighted in in bold. Um, it's this it's this issue about how if you become aware of a condition during escrow you know after you've disclosed things and you know you don't have to provide an amended disclosure you know it says however a subsequent or amended disclosure shall not be required for conditions and material inaccuracies of which the buyer is aware or which are disclosed in reports provided to or obtained by buyer or ordered and paid for by buyer this is heavily litigated and and i would not rely and my, my suggestion to you is do not rely on that language because what ends up happening in all in all these cases is, yes, the issue is disclosed in a in in one of the and I'm using air quotes there. It's disclosed in some report, but it's on page 57 of that report, and it says, you know, water issue. Um, it's it, it it's so it's a vague disclosure, and then we and then you find out that oh, the seller knew all about it because they made a claim last year, or they. You know they got a report and they didn't provide it and so if you think you're going to rely upon that statement that even even though it's in bold uh, and you know you find out something like you find out about that report during uh during escrow after you've done your disclosures and say oh you know well it's in the inspection report that there's a problem with xyz it's it's i i'm i'm going to tell you right now it's not going to save you it's it, what it's going to do it's going to it's it's going to get a non-disclosure claim it's going to get a fraud claim um, it when in doubt, disclose items that you know about that that uh, affect the value or desirability of the property. Don't rely on page 50, 57 of the inspection report that says you know water water issue and you know or drainage issue or something like that. Um, it, it's it's not going to save you. Let me move on to the next section here. Um, the natural hazard, uh, you know. The natural hazard uh, disclosures, the environmental. Again, I don't see a lot of people ever looking at those, but those are something that they probably should look at, especially if they're in in a more rural area of North County. Um, I would encourage you to to uh, to highlight that issue for for clients, the, the natural hazard, because they're they're just not they're they're not, they're getting those documents, and they're just that's that's part of the stack, right? That's part of the stack they didn't read is is the natural hazard. And um, I, I, I do see it, we, we try to use it in the defense of a lot of cases, but I, I end up getting uh, the statement from the, from the buyer saying, we, you know, my agent never went over that. My agent didn't tell me that was important. And it, it really is, and I'm especially encouraging in the, in the more rural areas of the county, which include North County here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, cruise through a little bit of this here um, so we can get to the to the meat uh, of the contract here but um, know that this is this is the section um, you know here's the HOA section I'm not going to go over that in detail I don't see that uh, being much of a problem the condition of the property uh, you know it is it does say it's sold as is and it does say it's it's the, the present condition but I'll tell you we, we still get lots and lots of claims of, of people uh, either the repairs were bad that they uh, that were made, or they weren't disclosing material facts, and and that's actually highlighted here uh, in material facts and defects. I think a lot you get, you get a lot of sellers who think, oh, I'm selling it as is. I don't need to disclose those material facts or defects. 
and 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 know that they they really have to, um, and it's 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 important that they do. Um, here here's another section on that. It's again in bold about the buyer strongly advised to conduct the inspection the investigations of the property, and and that they consider it's important. I don't see a lot of people uh, using that form, the buyer inspection elections form. I believe it's called the B I E form, if I'm, if I'm remembering that correctly. I don't, I'm not remembering it correctly because I don't see it a lot of the files, right? Uh, I don't think people are, are using it very often, but I, but I would encourage you to consider using that, uh, um, that form because what, what we tend to get in, in our, a lot of the claims is that they'll note an issue, right? Somebody will, somebody will note an issue. It'll either be some vague disclosure or it'll be in the inspection report, or there'll be some type of of a vague comment about something. And then, you know, and, and then these documents say, oh, you know, you have the opportunity to do a roof inspection or, or to get an expert to do an engineering report and, and the buyer will decline it. And the, the problem that we're seeing is we're, we're seeing not a lot of agents really recommending those reports and doing it forcefully doing it in writing and saying, you know, they've recommended a, a, uh, a roof inspection, you know, you, you've declined to do that. Uh, that's not something I'm as the agent going to check for you. So if you do get a water leak and, you know, in, in five months, it's, it's, it's not something that I, that I'm responsible for. And, and so, um, I, I would encourage you to consider using the buyer inspection election form and to also have that conversation and, and confirm in writing that they, the buyer does have, you know, they have a, this whole section here on their right to inspect, uh, the property, um, and so it's it's something that that they can do, and and the seller has a duty to make it available. That's what this section is here, um, that they you know they need to make it available in order to do it. Um, this this section down here at D, this uh, this notice of non responsibility that really has to do if the if the buyer is going to be uh, is the buyer is going to be doing work on the property. I I almost never see that done but but know that that's a possibility i don't i don't think it's a great idea as a seller to let a buyer do any work on the property um that that really is something that i, I would just give a credit um rather than doing something like that or even considering doing something like that um so moving on to title investing um this is your this is your uh, preliminary report. Again, you you have. Uh, I do an entire um, uh, uh, presentation on the preliminary report and how to read the title and what your obligations are in title. So I'll save that for for a different day. But but know that this is a contingency of the agreement and it's something that that needs to uh, that you need to go over with your client. Um, and and obviously those things are can be quite complicated or they can be very very simple. It really depends on the on the different property. Um, the, another thing I want to highlight here, um, is the, this manner of title, the man, you know, the, that there's legal and tax consequences, consult an appropriate professional. This is where, if they do have questions on how, how should we take title? How should we, uh, you know, what are, what are our, um, what are the, what are the consequences here? That's where you should be referring them to their attorney or their CPA. This section here is, is talking about how they will receive a title policy and it specifies the, the CLTA. That's what most people get, but, but know that there's multiple policies out there that you can purchase or that your, that your home buyer can purchase. And so that's, that's something to educate yourself on. Again, that's a different presentation, but it's something to educate yourself on, on, on uh, because a lot, of, a lot of clients I hear uh, you know, when they're looking at a title claim, they say, I didn't know, my agent never told me there were multiple policies. Or ne I, I was never informed of that. And they're just not experts on that issue. I'm not saying you're an expert, but, it, but it's getting them to be right experts on, on an issue like that. Uh, and now we get to, I, I would say, the most, the most disputed part of the RPA, which, which everyone knows and loves, which is the contingency removal section and the cancellation rights. Um, the... Every, you know, you'll, you'll know and love this as, as you go in your career, but certainly everyone knows about the, 
or you should know about you know how the time frame in which to, to provide disclosures and the time frame for the buyer to accept those disclosures. The defaults are seven and 17 days, but of course they can be altered and they can be altered if you deliver late. Um, and they all come down um, to the uh, to when the, disclo the disclosures are provided and, and the thoroughness of them. Um, the another thing that is that is often disputed in here is is this section on um, the uh, of repairs. The you know it, you have to start from the default that the seller doesn't have to make repairs or really even respond to the to a request for repairs, but they often do, and there's often a lot of back and forth on repairs. And one of the things I always suggest is is it unless the repairs are quite minor. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense for a seller to make repairs because we see claims on, oh, the repairs weren't done right, that you know, they weren't to the satisfaction of that, of that buyer, they didn't use a licensed contractor. And so if you're gonna ask for repairs to be done by the seller, if you're on the buyer side, be very specific. Say, I want a licensed contractor, or I want this, I want that. Be, don't, don't just say, you know, repair, uh, repair roof or something like that. I, I, I wanna see, some specificity in it, um, in order, in, if you if you think you're going to enforce it later on, you know that they actually did the work or not. And if you're on the on the seller side, you know consider a credit. Um, you know, let's be honest, a, a credit is is often better and, and more efficient than having some contractor come in and maybe do the work the way that the that the buyer wants or not. Um, but again, it's heavily. Uh, heavily disputed. I wouldn't say necessarily litigated, but heavily disputed on on these on these sections here. Uh, so be very familiar with it. Um, of course, you can do a uh, uh, you can remove your your contingencies here um, that with that with the offer. That's the type of thing where um, you know. Unless you're a flipper or a cash buyer, or, and and you're really sophisticated, I I almost would never do, and and you know even they even say here it's acting against the advice of the broker. If a client really wants to do that, they really want a house and they and they really want to make their offer as good as possible, you absolutely have to protect yourself with with a statement that this is against. I I wouldn't just rely upon this statement here. That's that I I would want to confirm that that is not something that you would recommend they do. Um, just because it's, it is a, it's, you know, really locks them into the transaction, uh, when they otherwise wouldn't be, but there is a form for that. And, and I think it arose out of the, the fact that a lot of people, uh, well, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but there were, there were flippers and other people who were going to rent it, completely renovate a property anyway. And they just wanted a, a way to show how, how strong their offer is. And so it rose out of that. Um, the this the seller right to cancel and the buyer contingencies um you know a, a lot of people think well if they if they miss their deadline we're out of contract and 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 i have to i have to dial that back a lot because it's it's not just missing your contingency deadline um you've got to provide that notice to perform and and and, and then it's a cancellation and so a, a lot of you know that i would be very familiar with that with that process that's something that uh, you, I, I would take the time to really understand how that works because you will encounter that, uh, you know, in, in not every transaction, but, but it, very frequently, uh, especially in a, in, a, in, a, in a strange market like we have right now with where it's appreciating market, but everyone's very nervous on things and, and deadlines are being missed left and right. Being on top of your notice to perform, whether you're on the buyer side or the seller side is really important. And so this is that section. And I would study this section uh, very carefully um, because the seller has a very limited right to cancel a transaction. The buyer has a, a, a much broader right, but as soon as they release those contingencies, it, it really shifts. And so that's where I would spend my time if I'm, if I'm looking at uh, these, uh, this form. And, and that's what this section is here. So I'll, I'll, I'll move through that, uh, but, but just know that this is heavily disputed um, and, and 
this this uh, this section here, the effective cancellation of deposits. You know, they have this section here on the the civil penalty, the thousand dollars for the refusal to sign a cancellation form. I'll, I'll tell you, that's not a deterrent at all. I, I haven't seen anyone balk at, at oh my gosh, I'm going to get a civil penalty of a thousand dollars. This is still heavily disputed, as as a lot of you know that this that. Uh, you know, one party will will say that we're out of contract. The other party will say that we aren't. And just know that the release of funds from escrow takes a mutual signed agreement. And so I, I suggest to a lot of sellers, maybe you want to sign that because you know you 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 might tie up your property for a long period while you're in this dispute. And on the on the buyer side, you know it it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're you know if you're at fault to uh, to you know fight for all your money back. So. Uh, those, the, this is a section where I'd say it's very specific to your actual transaction. So if you do have questions on that, that is a good time to get counsel involved on a transaction if, 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 there, if there starts to be a dispute over the deposit, um, because that's, that happens constantly. The, um, let me go into, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move over this section because we've talked about repairs and, and prorate, and here's the prorations of property taxes and other items. Not that all that interesting. The broker compensation, um, you, know, you know and love that section and in uh, the scope of duty of what you're going to be doing uh, and what you're not going to be doing. And, and I'll tell you again, uh, I haven't seen a buyer um, or a seller say that they've read this or that they have... Uh, that they have spent any time doing this, uh, they always gloss over this, and it's 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 nice to have in there, but it, it's not something that is will ne necessarily save you on a transaction if if there is an otherwise there's a claim. Um, the representative capacity, I'm not going to go over that, but that's if if you have multiple. That's generally if you have multiple uh, sellers and you can appoint someone. Um, the joint escrow instructions. This is really where your escrow instructions come in and, and you can specify the who is going to be the escrow holder. Having a good escrow, as, as, as many of you have, have maybe learned the hard way, is incredibly important. Having a responsive escrow holder and someone who's really going to work on your transaction, um, that's incredibly important, but I'm not going to spend any time on that because I want to move to uh, the remedies for, the, for, for a buyer's breach of contract. Uh, this is in the liquidated damages clause. Now, this is one of those clauses where unless, uh, unless both sides sign, it's not effective. So if just one, if, you're, if your buyer signs, but the seller doesn't reinitial it, uh, it's not a, you don't have a meeting of the minds, right? Because remember a contract requires offer and acceptance. They're not accepting this section, right? That's why there are initials here. So, you know, be aware that the, uh, the liquidated damages, while, while you think they could be only 3%, um, you know, it, it, and, uh, you know, or the deposit actually paid it, it could potentially be more depending on, you know, what ended, what ended up happening. Now, if you have 3% of a transaction and, and, and you have it and you have a deposit, I, I would be hard pressed to find how they had damages beyond that, but they might. And so it's, it's very, uh, it's important that, your client understands this section and reads the section. And if they, again, if they have questions on this section, it's often a referral to counsel if, if, uh, uh, if necessary. The same thing goes with this section on dispute resolution. Um, I, I know that, um, that there's, uh, there's always a question on what's the difference between mediation and arbitration? Should I initial the arbitration? And mediation is a vol I'll, I'll, uh, for those of you who don't know, mediation is a voluntary process that isn't isn't required by the contract, but the contract essentially penalizes you if you don't go into mediation. So, what it does is, if the if the buyer wants or the seller want to sue each other, they have to go to mediation first, or they lose the opportunity to get attorney's fees if they ultimately litigate. Which is, as, as some of you know, attorney's fees can be even higher than the damages. And so to think that you would, you have the potential to lose that or that the only, the only the other side could recover that really forces just about everyone into mediation in, in, a, in a dispute over this contract. And when I say everyone, 
I mean the buyer and the seller. I, it doesn't require that the, the brokerage go, but I, and, and I often see it, it's split between whether I see brokerages attending and, and brokerages not attending these mediations, but you have the opportunity to go. So you'll, you'll often see that, that they'll demand that you attend and that's really up to your brokerage and, and to you of whether you'll be attending that mediation. But that's completely different than arbitration. So what arbitration is, so, so once that mediation is over and there's no resolution, if there's a resolution, great, everyone moves on. If, if there is no resolution, it, it can either go to, uh, it, it, they can either drop the claim, maybe, they, maybe that, you know, that, that aggrieved party will never file a claim, or they will, they will, they will bring a, a litigation and they'll either bring it in superior court or they can bring it in arbitration. And they can only bring in arbitration if both sides initial this section. And, uh, and, and I, 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 uh, I characterize as, as public school versus private school. So public school is superior court. It's gonna take a long time. You're gonna get, you're gonna get a lot of protections of, you know, you can get the protections of, for instance, of uh, the appellate courts. Um, if, if there's a claim, you, you, know, you, may, have a, you may have a jury trial. Uh, depending on the claim, and you you have all those, you but it's going to take a really long time, and it might be much more expensive. Uh, the the arbitration is typically be, before a retired judge, and it often moves a lot quicker. But you're at the you're somewhat at the mercy of that arbitrator, and their decision is their decision, and it is very limited. Um, ability to appeal that and, and you can get a situation where you have a, an arbitrator who you think might be you know have it out for you or have it out for the, the your your buyer or seller and it's it's quite possible they, they do and you know you're at the, you're at their mercy so a lot of people ask you know should we initial this or you'll have your clients ask should we initial this and it's really something that you know I, I would push on to um, th their attorney and make them make the decision because what you don't really want to give here is legal advice and, and what you're, what you're probably doing when you say, I recommend you go to arbitration or I recommend you don't sign that, um, is you're really giving a legal advice and could they criticize you for that? Yes. Do I see them do it often? No, but that doesn't mean they won't. And if they get a bad outcome, you know, or if they get cross with you, that's another thing that they could, they could throw out there. So, um, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that you become an expert on, on arbitration mediation, but I would want to know my way around the two uh, because you're going to get that question and I'm sure you're already getting that question. So I'm going to move through this section really quick here. This is the, uh, uh, this is the, the section on um, uh, essentially attorney's fees is, is probably the most important section here and the other terms of the offer and getting down here to the, to the essentially the, uh, the, the heart of the, of the transaction is where you must sign the expiration of the offer and the acceptance of offer. These are the two sections that, you're, that will have to be signed in order to enter into this contract. Um, again, I'm not gonna go over that in, in too much detail, um, but I do wanna highlight this section here on the presentation of the offer and rejection of the offer. This came out of about, about two or three years ago. This was, this is probably the biggest issue that I came, that I, I would present to a couple hundred uh, agents. And the first question I would get is, uh, everyone's ignoring my offers. I submitted offers to this brokerage and this brokerage won't, you know, they won't respond to my offers. I don't even know if it actually got to them. And so CAR, I think heard that and they have this section now on the presentation and rejection of offers. And I'll tell you, they do audit this. So if, if you end up getting in a situation where you get reported to the DRE, they, they do look for this. And you know, my firm does, does do defense of agents and brokers against the DRE complaints. And they're looking for this. They're looking to whether you presented that offer, you know, was, it, was it rejected? Why did you reject a an offer that was fifty thousand dollars more for the for than than the other one, and oh by the way, it was a double end deal. It was a dual agency. You better have a good reason, right? And and I want that reason documented in writing. Oh you, re oh buyer you re or seller you really like this family, or or you really you, you thought the other offer was had too many contingencies. I mean make make that presentation in writing of why 
um, you know, of why you went with a different offer and know that this isn't just a, uh, this section really should be filled out even if you're, if you're gonna reject the offer. We wanna see that in the file or else, you know, it, it's gonna be hard to prove that you actually presented this, this document. And now I, I, I'm, I'm well aware that, um, that we're, uh, we've come up on our time here. I, I have a lot more to, to talk about today, um, but I know that, that in these Zoom calls, uh, oftentimes we, we run out of time. So uh, I don't know, Shirley, if, if you want me to continue, can you uh, continue going on um, and moving on to the next topic after the RPA? But I, uh, if everyone wants to stay on, I'm, I'm more than happy to continue uh, the presentation to talk about a couple of other forms and a couple of actual common errors that I see, but I do realize that it is past 11 o'clock. So, um, okay, Fred, I, I think if, if the attendees want to go ahead and stay on, um, go for it. Okay. All right. So I, 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 I'm moving on to another section here. Um, and this specifically has to do with, um, what I would consider the other essential forms of, of a transaction, which are the disclosure documents. So the disclosure documents are, are very critical. Um, you know, as we were talking about uh, previously there, the, um, they, they really start with the AD form, which is the agency disclosure. And it really has to come down to your, to the, your fiduciary duty. And, and as some of you who have been to my red flags class or my litigation avoidance class, it, everything starts with the fiduciary duty, and it's really about putting your clients, um, and, and this goes into the forms as well. I mean, it's the essential part of the transaction that it really, you have to put your, you have to put th uh, their interests first. And a lot of, a lot of clients, um, or I shouldn't say a lot of clients, a lot of uh, agents think that that really means we have to save money for my client. And that's not what it is. It's not you saving money for your client. It's, it's, it's looking after their best interests and their best interests isn't necessarily money. That's wrong. It is to disclose and keep them out of a, a, a fraud situation. So let me, let's, let me go into understanding the essentials of disclosure. The a, a disclosure, you know, here's, here's, uh, 2079, which is, uh oh, something happened here. Let's see. There we go. It's that a real estate, you have a duty to do that visual inspection, but also to disclose to a prospective purchaser all facts materially affecting the desire, the value or desirability of the property. It's not just um, a visual. And, and that's pretty important because a lot, of, a lot of agents think, oh, well, if I didn't see it, you know, yeah, I had an email on it. Yeah, I had this report. Or yeah, I knew about this. Someone told me about it, but I didn't have to disclose it because it wasn't a visual issue. That's wrong. And that's my suggestion to you is that uh, you, you should look at this as when, I, when you're disclosing in these documents, and here are the, really the three critical documents, is that the, tr the TDS, the SPQ, and the ASIC. So let's let's talk about them for a second here. So, the and I'm going to read something to you on this breach of fiduciary duty. The KC4107 there. That's actually the jury instructions. And so let, let me read this to you because I think I, I can't emphasize this enough because this is what a jury would actually hear. The facts that a broker and, and this applies to an agent too must learn, and the advice and counsel required of the broker depend on the facts of the transaction, the knowledge and experience of the client, the questions asked by the client, the nature of the property and the terms of sale. Could it be any more broad, right? Could, can, we, can we make that any broader, right? Or any more subjective is what I'd suggest. And it goes on though. The broker must place himself or herself in the position of the client and consider the type of information required for the client to make a well-informed decision. I mean, that's about as subjective as you could possibly be. Um, and so what, I, what I'd suggest to you is that you really need to disclose what you know. There isn't a, uh, and this is where I, this section here where I said agents believe, some agents believe that their fiduciary duty is just to save their client's money. 
and their client is saying, well, I don't want to disclose that. I, I'll, get a, I'll get a lower deal. That's not your duty. That's not your disclosure duty. That's not what you're required to do in the AVID uh, and in the other disclosure documents. And so if you do that, you, you're going to get the potential for liability. I'm not going to say you're going to lose a case or that you, you're going to have liability. That's unknown. Even, even the worst cases you might win, even the best cases you might lose, but you're going to have problems eventually um, because that's fraud. And if, if you don't know this already, your, your license is at risk if, uh, if, you, do, if you are convicted of fraud. Um, and it's, that's, that's, that, you know, that doesn't seem like it would be worth it for, for a transaction where a client is asking you to, to commit that uh, because it's, you're the one who's going to be on the line. Um, one of the issues that uh, is is really important in the and I and I consider it essential and I consider it essential contract really of a transaction is the source of information because I see a lot of agents doing this and they 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 don't understand the the what I call the verification trap which that then here's the scenario they get information from some source and they pass it along to their buyer as and, and say you know so, someone said or the seller says uh this this property was built to code or this pro property has permits right and instead of saying the seller say you know what they should be saying is the seller says there's permits i haven't seen any i'm not going to be checking for that that for you i suggest you go and hire a professional to to investigate that and you'd investigate it yourself what they what they what the agents sometimes end up doing is the seller says that and they say it's permitted they don't even say that the seller said it they just said it's permitted yeah it's no, we checked that box and what what have you done then what you what you've done is now you've verified that information now you own it right and god forbid that place isn't isn't permitted that's a potential claim and and it comes from the Salah Hooten case which essentially says that you, you cannot accept information from another person such as a seller as being true and transmit it to your client without either verifying it, which I don't always, which you know, is, is a dangerous thing in itself, or disclosing that the, or you have to disclose the information and the source of it and that it hasn't been verified and that you're not doing it. And so I, 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 I bring this up in the essential contracts because this is something I think you should, you should create a habit of, almost create a contract in your head that if you're getting information during that escrow, that's important information that the buyer has asked you about or that has been transmitted to you, you make a habit. You even have a, a form email that, that you're going to, because remember if it didn't, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen, right? A lot of, uh, you know, that verbal conversation you had where you say you're not going to verify it uh, will be misremembered by your client. Um, put it in writing that you're not going to be verifying this information. Create a form like that. Create a, a practice and procedure in your brokerage to do that because I see this time and time and time again where, you know, they'll, they'll say, yeah, I talked to them about it. I said that, you know, it was, you know, I said verbally it was permitted or there's a, or there's like a vague text message that says that, you know, that's, uh, that looks like it was written by my, my daughter. Um, and, you know, and it's a misspellings and, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't do what, what the purpose of it, of what it's supposed to be, which is to protect you that you're not going to be verifying this information. So I, I want you to, to, to understand that. And here's another uh, issue. This is common errors by agents in the disclosure forms. And the first one is not staying in their lane, which is essentially uh, agents taking on uh, duties that they, they don't have expertise in, you know, something like the permitting issue, something like zoning, something like title issues, something like, um, you know, you, you, you want to name engineering. I mean, I, I've seen it all, but I, but I've seen uh, these, I've seen agents, they want to close the deal. They're, they're, they, they really want to do it. And what they end up doing is they end up minimizing things for, for clients and saying, oh, that's no big deal. Or all, all the windows in this neighborhood have problems or, you know, there's, and they, and they really minimize it. And what I call it is not staying in their lane where they're not an expert on that. They may not be an expert on engineering, 
And, and why are you taking that risk on? How, how hard is it to, to tell the client that you're, not, that you're not an expert on that? And most clients appreciate that. They understand who's an expert on what. Um, and, and so that's, that's a common error I see on the disclosure forms that they try to minimize things, especially on the AVID. They, you know, I, I can't tell you many times I've seen a clean AVID with, with nothing. There's nothing to disclose, really? Come on. Um, it's it just not, it's just not believable. Um, I also see them, you know, uh, verifying in the information, as we said, uh, not, not relying on the seller as the gatekeeper. I mean, they're the ones with the information. They're the ones who's lived there. Um, use them as the, as the gatekeeper on, on information, the, you know, filling out like the TDS and filling out the SPQ for people. Um, don't do that. Uh, don't, don't have it in your handwriting. If you're hand, if you're doing it by hand, um, most of the time it's not being done by hand, but, but e even so it's, it's something that, uh, that I, that I'd like them to, to see, uh, that you, you, some kind of confirming email that you went over that with them, but that you didn't, uh, uh you didn't fill it out for them. Uh, recommending professional inspections, you know, having that, that, uh, you know, having that recommendation is, is, is critically important. Um, and I, I see a lot of other Brett, problems. Of, I'm sorry. Brett, unfortunately, there is a town hall webinar starting in the next couple of minutes. So unfortunately, we we're going to have to uh, end this one and maybe do a part two to finish it. Not a problem. Um, well, you know, thank you everyone for, for coming here today. I do have a little bit more that I, that I, uh, I'll do a part two on or, or, or uh, I'll see you at the next Disclo uh, the next uh, webinar. Uh, you know, we could I could go on and on for for days on some of these topics and and give you a lot of, of, of uh, examples. But I, what I what I would say for now, though, because we we ran out of time, is and I'll I'll, I'll kind of go through those those items there. But I want uh, uh, here's my contact information if I can find it here. Um, hmm. Let's see where that slide is. No worries. No worries, Fred. I will email well, you know it to what? everyone. We'll provide the contact information. It looks like there's a there's a computer error. We'll provide that contact information and and get that out to everyone with a copy of and we'll get a copy of these slides. And we'll get scheduled to um, part two scheduled. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you everyone okay. for attending. Thanks and everyone. Feel free to call me. Oh, there, <laughs> right at the end there, there there it shows my contact information. So again, feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Good information.